Uh, welcome to uh, Archmere Academy's three questions with the admission office. A uh, little video vignette uh, asking admission counselors and deans and directors a few questions about the industry and their school. And uh, we'll catalog these and allow our families and students to view them at their will. Uh, we're very fortunate enough to have Mr. John Mahoney, uh, Boston College's Vice Provost for Enrollment Management with us today. Uh, John has uh, is well known in Delaware circles. He's he's the uh, individual in the Boston College office responsible for Delaware applications. And if I'm correct, John, do I remember correctly? Thirty eight years you've been traveling the state of Delaware for Boston College. Not quite. Thirty five years, Chris. Thirty five. Well, yeah. we, we certainly hope it'll be thirty eight in a few years. Me too. Okay. So uh, the three questions that we have, and it may lead into some additional questions, John. But the first one I have for you is. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Boston College that you would want every prospective student and their family to know? How can families learn about this during the college search process? Sure, Chris. Thanks for having me, by the way, and uh, commend you, as always, for being as uh, imaginative and as innovative uh, as you've always been in terms of this college counseling. You and I have done programs together a number of years, and uh, I have a lot of regard for you and your staff, and, of course, great regard for Archmere Academy, because I've just been... Uh, familiar with it for 35 years, reading applications, meeting students, and we have some terrific students who come to Boston College and really excelled here uh, based on the great foundation that they had at, at Archmere. So in terms of answering your first question, you know, you and I have been doing this for a long time, so I, I get rather philosophical about this kind of stuff. As, as we're thinking about what's distinctive about Boston College, I, I actually would just back up one step and say, you know, from, from an advice standpoint, young people getting on this pathway to college, I always say to them, you know, take some time, and my guess is you and your staff echo this as well, take some time before you begin reading brochures, talking to your counselors, visiting campuses, to just really sort of um, take some quiet time for yourself. Um, uh, go into a room, be reflective, be introspective, uh, whatever age you are, 16, 17. When I say this sometimes, parents say, or adults say, kids aren't reflective at that age. And I say they are, I, I believe they are. But really just taking some time to really think about who you are and what you want out of your college experience um, and asking those questions, who am I? What do I really want? What kind of learning environment is gonna suit me the best? Um, what kinds of role models and mentors do I want? What kinds of people do I want surround myself with? Um, do I want a large school? Do I want a small school? Do I want rural? Do I want urban? Do I want something in between? And the beauty <clears throat> of all those questions is that they have nothing to do with an individual college. They have everything to do with you. And so working up a kind of a profile of the characteristics, the qualities that you really want as you begin this search. And then if you can emerge from that little introspective session and talk to people that care about you and love you, like your parents and your counselors, especially Chris and his staff, chances are that as you tick off some of those qualities, they're gonna say, you know what? I have an idea. I, there's a school that you might wanna explore or multiple schools that you might wanna explore. So make sure you don't uh, overlook what I consider to be that first important step in a good college search process. So if I'm putting that onus on you, I would say, you know, college and, colleges and universities have, ought to have a pretty good idea, a pretty good sense of who they are and what they're trying to accomplish over this critical four-year period in your lives. And to me, that's one of the many things that recommends Boston College very strongly. We as a Catholic Jesuit university, and that's really my point about distinctiveness, as a Catholic Jesuit university, we have a very clear sense of who we are as an institution, as a university, and more importantly, what we're trying to accomplish over this four-year period, important period in your lives. So a little bit, just a short, uh, a short background on Jesuit education, this philosophy, these values, these ideals that sort of underpin the experience at Boston College. Jesuit education has been around for now almost 500 years, founded by this remarkable uh, man named St. Ignatius of Loyola. And St. Ignatius was born in the Basque region of Spain 
educated at the University of Paris, fell in with a group of friends at that point, uh, very fervent religious faith. Uh, after some time after their years at the University of Paris, they decided that they wanted to form their own religious order. It was recognized by the Vatican. Uh, at, at first, uh, they weren't in the business of education. They were in the business of simply doing good, helping people. That was their singular goal. But being rather smart men, they realized they could have a much larger impact if they could educate people in the values and the ideals that they embraced and that they believed in. And so that's when they really get into the business of higher education or education in general. Here we are some 500 years later, and I would say that Jesuit education is really known throughout the world for it, the quality of its high schools, its colleges, and its universities everywhere. Many of the, there are 28 Jesuit colleges in the United States. You know Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. You know Fordham University in New York. You might know Loyola Marymount and Santa Clara on the West Coast, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a nationwide network of 28 schools. And there are certain touch points, values that we espouse and that we really believe strongly in. And I think they're recognizable to students right from the time that they get here. First and foremost would be the educational model. Sure, we have undergraduate colleges of arts and sciences, management, education, and nursing. And you do have to apply to one of those four undergraduate colleges at Boston College. But the fact of the matter is, you'll apply to one of those schools, you would be accepted to one of those schools, you would enroll in that school, you'd pursue a degree in that school. Maybe, it, maybe you'd have a double major. But the, the touchstone of the experience, the foundation of the educational model at Boston College, regardless of the school you're in or the major that you choose, is our strong belief in the value and the critical importance of a broadly based liberal arts education. So the Jesuits have always preached the power, the value, the critical importance of liberal arts education. They were doing that 500 years ago. They're still doing it today. And I'm gonna step out on a limb here and say that I think liberal arts education might be even more important today than it's been throughout past centuries. And I say that largely due to the impact that technology is having on our world. It's changing the way that we live. It's changing the way that we work. And so oftentimes our career center is telling students, you might be going to college today for a job that doesn't even exist. Uh, that's how volatile things are at this point. And so sure, you'll choose an area, you will gain expertise in a particular area. It may lead to graduate school, it may lead to a job, and that would be great. But the fact of the matter is, all of you, as you're considering your college path, are looking at lots of uncertainty, lots of change ahead. And I would argue that a liberal arts education, because it gives you a very broad foundation, exposure to many different subject areas, many different ideas, many different ways of looking at the world, because it really encourages you to have that breadth in addition to the depth that you'd have with a major, it does certain things. It really trains you how to be a good critical reader, how to be a good analytical thinker, how to solve problems, how to work with others. And I would say most importantly, it teaches you to be an effective communicator with the written word and the spoken word. And those qualities that I just listed, I would say to you that regardless of whether it's 200 years ago or today, those are things that employers value. The ability to think, the ability to speak, the ability to write, the ability to work with others. That's what a good liberal arts education does for you. So that's the core, that's sort of the pedagogical model of, of Jesuit education. And then there are certain other characteristics. We have mottos like educating men and women for others. We believe strongly in the fact that your education is intended to benefit you personally and to help you um, establish for yourselves a secure life, you know, to be financially secure. That's important in today's world. But we're really encouraging students to think in a larger way about not only taking your education and using it for your personal benefit, but also to make a difference 
in the community where you live, maybe on a larger scale in, your, in the country, maybe in the world. Maybe you're being called to that kind of public service. So the idea of educating men and women for others. Lastly, Jesuit education is distinguished uh, by uh, something that is best captured in a Latin phrase, and that Latin phrase is cura personalis, cura personalis. That means education of the whole person, care for the individual person. And I think that's what Boston College and Jesuit education, but Boston College in particular, we take that very seriously. There's a, there's a recognition in the Jesuit model of education that you arrive on our doorsteps at the age of 18, sort of the end of adolescence. You leave us at the age of 22, you might say, the beginning of adulthood. I don't think there are too many people that would argue with me that that's not a critical phase in any human being's development. And it's not just intellectual, it's social, it's emotional, it's psychological, it's spiritual, it's all of those things. And so, of course, we're gonna deliver to you a first-rate education. We wouldn't be open, we wouldn't be a college or a university if we didn't take education seriously. But Boston College aspires to more. Uh, we aspire to really hoping that you will grow and develop over these four years, that you will reflect upon the person that you are when you arrive, the person that you want to become, and what kind of life that you actually want to live. And we're not afraid at a Jesuit Catholic university to encourage you to ask a question, what constitutes a good life? You know, what's a good and meaningful life? Um, you could say that that's defined purely in material or financial terms, I suppose. And we encourage you to think beyond that and to think about what is a meaningful and fulfilling life, a rewarding life, and one that has an impact, again, on the world. Um, I think that Chris and I might share uh, a common feeling. You know, we do what we do uh, because we love what we do. And I think wherever you are in your life, when you get to be in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, like me, I know a lot of friends who don't necessarily like what they do today. Uh, they make a living and they do well. I can truthfully say I continue to enjoy what I do, helping young people, families, working with counselors to make this important transition from high school to college. And so to be able to say that you really are passionate about your work, you care about your work, uh, that's important in addition to having a good lifestyle. Thanks, John. Uh, I do agree with you. I, I, I have long said there's days I don't want to go to work, but there are not days that I don't want to go to Archmere. <laughs> so what we do is, is very valuable. And uh, thanks for that um, introduction to BC. And I think a lot of what you touched on is why our families so much and our students specifically uh, appreciate the Jesuit education and specifically at Boston College because we do have so many applications every year and, and are fortunate to have a large number of students up there um, get, making the most of, the, of their Boston College experience. I'm, I'm going to shift with question two a little to from Boston College specific to, to the industry a little bit. Uh, our families and, and uh, always like to know what they're getting themselves into. And I think when they understand why things happen the way they happen, uh, they're able to cope uh, a little better with difficult decisions, but also, you know, a little bit strategically perhaps make the best decisions for them. Uh, Tell us uh, about a recent trend that, that you've seen impacting the admissions practice at your school. What is that trend and how has it and how will it continue to affect your school and office? Sure. Um, well, Chris, you know, you and I have been doing this kind of work for a long time. So I, I don't know that this is necessarily a recent trend. But, you know, someday maybe I aspire to write a book about my career, my experiences here. And I... I would say if somebody writes the book on college admission, uh, you'd have to look at the decade of the 1990s as a pivotal one. Um, it's a, a time period where, you know, from the early 1990s, uh, the number of high school graduates in this country had pretty much bottomed out uh, after a, a, a slow, steady decline. But from the early 90s forward through until about 2009, 2010, there was just a huge upward trajectory in the number of high school graduates. It went from about 2.4 million in the early 90s 
to now about 3.2, 3.3 million high school graduates across the country. So that, that started in the 90s, but also happening in the 1990s, you had the dawn of what we today commonly call and use as the internet. You know, back when I, back in the early 90s when I became director of admission at BC, there was no internet. There is now, and that has pretty much revolutionized the way that college, the, 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 that young people research colleges and universities and, and in, in fact apply to colleges and universities. There, it was the dawn of electronic applications, the growth and popularity of the common application. So I think that contemporary college admission is still being very much affected by those things that happened in the 1990s. What has happened is I think it's allowed colleges and, and, and universities to market themselves much more easily and much more aggressively to families. And so you've got almost a perfect storm of ingredients, the population rising, the ease of applying rising, colleges certainly aggressively seeking the best students uh, for their institutions. And what we've seen is just an incredible escalation of applications at almost all colleges during that time period to the point where you could almost say there are nearly staggering numbers especially at the highly selective number uh, level and also almost you know frighteningly low acceptance rates you know you're looking at the ivy leagues today at five six seven percent acceptance rates uh, the next year maybe in the teens bc uh, this year at about a 27 percent acceptance rate so th this to me these are the trends that are affecting college admission today and as young people and their families are beginning i think these are the things that are top of mind and and in many ways most intimidating to them because they see it as a very challenging uh, a very challenging thing so that might be a way for me to sort of segue into how Boston College has just recently adjusted to this. You know, and Archmere families have known for a while that we've been uh, in terms, we have you know, two plans for applying. There's regular decision January 1, sort of in, in accordance with all other schools, there's a regular decision deadline. And we used to have an open-ended non-binding early action program. And over the last several years, simply because it is open-ended, non-binding, and it does afford families or students the opportunity to find out an admission decision in December, to know that they've got a guaranteed spot at a particular institution, but that they could shift their loyalty, they could change that in January, February, March. That's a great, that gives students a lot of freedom. It gives them a lot of assurance, I think, in a very anxiety riddled environment. You know, I've got at least one or two schools that I know I'm admitted to, then you can move forward with more selective schools. So we did that, but this past year, we reached, you know, we, we've been steadily rising. We've gone to 10,000 early action applications. and We hit 15,000 this year. Uh, that's a November one deadline and we pledged to get decisions out by the middle of December. That was a tall order for the admission staff at BC to treat those applications with the care and attention we, that, that we know they deserve. We did that, but I think the other byproduct that we saw coming, we've been thinking about this for a number of years, uh, but the other byproduct is, you know, in a pool that large and that talented and, and that seemingly interested in Boston College that they were that they, they graced us with an application of early action, it becomes harder and harder for us to really identify in a pool that large those that are most serious, that I would call the best fit candidates for Boston College, the ones who really, if admitted, are are going to be very serious about BC. They're going to maybe come to BC or at least narrow it down to, okay, I've got Boston College and now it's BC and one or two other schools. I think early action has sort of swirled out of control because of the ease of being able to submit so many early action applications. So as you know, we announced a major policy change uh, back in January of 2019. We are going to abandon early action and introduce two rounds of early decision. Uh, there's gonna be one uh, with a November 1 deadline and we'll communicate decisions by early December and there's going to be an early decision two deadline line of January 1, and we'll try to have those decisions out by the end of January, early February. I know that early decision uh, is binding. I know that it's, it has a little bit, a little bit more 
of, of a challenge for a student, you, you know, for a student to make that kind of a binding commitment early in his or her senior year, that can be overwhelming as well. Uh, that, that, that can, they, they may not have the certainty that they want to do that. Uh, certainly financial aid is an issue for a lot of uh, young families today and early decision. I mean, BC is a school that is need blind and meets full needs. So uh, on the surface, we intend to, if we admit you, uh, meet your need based upon uh, your completion of the financial aid application. But I know early decision can be uh, something that is a little bit intimidating for a family to make that kind of a commitment admissions wise and financially uh, early in the senior year and to sort of place all their eggs in one basket. I, I, I understand that. But we also, I mean, our rationale for it is that it now gives students the opportunity to, if you will, reveal themselves to us as somebody who is definitely committed to Boston College. And of course that works well for us because we know we're getting those what I call best fit candidates. They are, they've researched BC, they know BC is their top choice. From the standpoint of enrolling that student, retaining that student, we, we, we know there's a presumably a, a contentment, a happiness factor. This is where they want to be. They're gonna thrive in an, an environment where they wanna be. Uh, and so, we do believe that it has benefits both for students and of course for Boston College. So if I could ask a quick follow-up to that, John, what do you expect that to do to BC's applicant pool? Mm -hmm. And as a student who's considering an early decision application, uh, how might my application be read, at, if at all, uh, uniquely or differently because of the application decision that I've decided? Sure. Well, the first, uh, the first reaction to that policy change is that we are expecting a dramatically lower, uh, uh, a dramatically smaller pool of candidates at that November 1 deadline. That 15,000 will, you know, we're in sort of uncharted territory here, Chris, but, but we're projecting that we might be somewhere in the range of 2,000 to 3,000 early decision applications. So, what it does is it frees up the staff to really give even more care and attention to the, the review of those applications, the consideration of those applications. They're gonna be scrutinized even more carefully than they were uh, when we're having to read 15,000 in the space of about six weeks or so. So the care, the attention of the selection process will certainly, uh, I think, be enhanced and, and we're very pleased about that. Now, I think early decision always raises another concern, which is, okay, so how much of your class will be filled with those early decision candidates because they are making that binding commitment? When we had early action up until this year, about 30% of our applications came in through early action, and I was always very committed to saying, look, if 30% if of our total applicant pool comes in through early action, then we should be enrolling about 30% of our class. This year, the early actions went to about 40% of our pool, 40, almost 45%. So about 45% of our enrolled freshman class this year is through early action. So we've got a challenge on our hands to determine how many spots will be consumed in the class by early decision. We're expecting right now, Chris, we, we, we want to stay away from the idea of enrolling half or more of our class from early decision. And so at least at this point, again, we've not gone through the process yet, but through early decision one and early decision two, we would be hoping to enroll about 40 to 45 percent of our class still leaving open potentially 55, uh, 50 to 55 percent of our class um, uh, for the regular decision process. Thank you, John. Uh, our final question in our, in our three-part question series, uh, could you share something in, within the application reading and decision process that families really uh, don't understand, uh, either in general or something unique to your process, or something that you, you think that families don't really have a true grasp about, or students uh, in, the, in the application read process? Sure. Uh, well, I think, I think that, your families are are well prepared. I think I think they're pretty savvy, and, and so um, I, I I think uh, a couple of things that I would tell you 
about the application reading and process of Boston College. And I've said this, of course, when I've been at Archmere, either speaking to your parent groups or, or to the students sitting around the conference room table in your office. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do at Boston College is to attract really strong uh, people to our office who are committed to the field of admission and are going to stay and grow in that field. You know, and of course, I'm one of them. I was hired as an assistant director 35 years ago. Uh, and if, you know, if we can hire good people and retain them and place them in regions where they build up a good knowledge base about their schools and, and a, you know, a good relationship with counselors and families in those schools, then I think that's not only going to benefit Boston College, but it's going to benefit the high schools in their territories. So uh, you know, I'm sort of a unique, a rare example in that I've been the first reader on all applications from the state of Delaware for these past 35 years. So to say that uh, I know the Archmere curriculum, that I, I, I know the curriculums at the other great schools in Delaware is an understatement. I, I can provide that perspective. Uh, I, I know, you know, and, and if I have a question, I can call you or I can call one of my other great colleagues down there in the Wilmington area or, or further south in, in Delaware. So I think what I'd want to establish with all of your families is that I can I will continue even with that vaunted title that you uh, that you recited at the top of this uh, interview of vice provost for enrollment management. I still read the Delaware applications and and and, and plan to continue to do that. So I think the 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 um, the reassurance that I'd provide to your families is that um, you've got somebody who knows your institution well. Uh, and has not only read the applications, admitted students and enrolled them, but then followed them through their years here at BC and seen how they've done in the classroom and beyond. Uh, the other thing that I'd say, Chris, maybe is, and I, I think your families know this because I've already referenced how, just how competitive and overwhelming this process can be. Those application numbers are staggering. The acceptance rates can be staggering. Uh, and I guess what I would just offer to your families is this, you, you know, it, if you step into that arena of highly selective college admission, you have to acknowledge that you're stepping into a relatively small arena. You know, I think this process is sometimes defined by the relatively small group of schools that are highly selective. And that unfortunately takes some attention away from some really great schools out there that would be great fits for you, that would allow you to achieve all of your goals and aspirations. You know, life as you know it doesn't end if you don't get into one of these highly selective schools. There are other great institutions out there, public and private. But BC, thankfully, is among that group of what I'd consider to be highly selective schools. And what that means, simply stated, is that we're blessed each year with far more qualified and deserving candidates than we could possibly accommodate in our freshman class, okay? So that's the tough part about it. And what it really means is that, you know, you could do everything right in this process. You could take the most challenging curriculum that Archmere offers. You could excel in that curriculum. You could have SAT or ACT scores that are really on the high end of our mid 50% range or above that range. You could have a really impressive list of activities, um, uh, uh, leadership opportunities, recognition for the things that you've done outside the classroom. You could have glowing testimonials from your teachers and your guidance counselors. You could write an essay that really attracts my attention. And I'm a former English teacher, so I, I read those with great care and sensitivity. You could do all those things right but you could still not achieve your goal. And I think it's important for me to say to you in this session, make sure that in no way, shape, or form do you ever view this college admission process, particularly the selective college admission process, as any kind of gauge on the student that you've been during your years at Archmere, but more importantly, the human being that you are. Because it's not a gauge of that. These decisions at the highly selective level are very much driven by some of these forces that I've talked about already, the huge rise in applications, the ease of applying. So make sure that you don't view the process that way. And I'll close this little uh, a point by saying to you that the one part of this process over which you as students have complete control 
is the essay. Think about it. That's the one part. And at Boston College, you've got, of course, the common application essay, and you do have a supplementary essay with four different prompts, one of which you select, that really, I think, are designed to uh, resonate with our mission and our values and our ideals. So I urge you, as I'm sure the staff at Archmere urges you, take those applications seriously, because in many ways, it's the one opportunity that you have to set yourself apart, to really tell us who you are. Use that essay, if you will, as a vehicle to tell us something meaningful and important about yourself. And so I'll just give you one little tip here. Uh, I'm gonna end with this on this particular point. From 35 years of reading college essays, you don't wanna do the math on the number of essays that I've read. Add to that five years as a college, high school English teacher, the numbers are staggering in terms of the number of essays that I've written, uh, that I've read and written for that matter. So I, I wanna give you a piece of advice. Um, from my years of doing this, I've got, a, I've got a, an old fashioned manila folder that I've saved the best essays through the years that have really made an impression on me. So, and I see a formula to that that I would just pass along to you. You've got to come up with a topic, but I do see a formula that I think is really important. Number one, um, don't overthink this, okay? Don't, don't, don't be seeking it. I think the topic, is really right in front of you. The best essays that I've read through the years, both for the Common Application Essay and for the BC Essay, uh, my best advice to you is tell us a story. You know, because that's why we read, whether we read novels or we read biographies or we read histories, tell us a story. Now, preferably a story about you, not somebody else, because it's you that wants to be admitted to Boston College. and. These stories, as I give you that challenge, these stories are right in front of you. They're right under your nose, literally. The best stories, I think, are part of what I would call your family folklore. The things that you, the stories that you tell, that you laugh about, that you cry about when you're at family gatherings like Fourth of July cookouts or Thanksgiving. They're part of family folklore. They, they define you, they define your family, they're part of your story. Those, those stories are easily taken for granted, but I think they're also very rich in helping you to define yourself and for us to learn about you in this process. So tell us a story, not a story that's necessarily self-glorifying, but a story that's self-revealing. From a technical standpoint, I have two other pieces of advice. Number one, have a great opening sentence because a great opening sentence slows an admissions reader down. If it's, and I'm not talking about something that's gimmicky, uh, I'm talking about something that's thoughtful and provocative, and if you will, leading. That's just uncertain enough that the reader says, hmm, where is he or she going with this? So, um, a great opening sentence that's thoughtful, that's provocative, that slows the reader down and really encourages him or her to, to, to read this more slowly and more thoughtfully. And then finally, the best essays in that file are ones that have used imagery very effectively. So in telling the story, some sort of lingering image that characterizes the story, that defines the story. You might introduce it at the beginning, you might introduce it in the middle, you might leave it as the end point. But what a good image does to me as a reader is as I've moved along three, four applications beyond your application, when I can't get that image out of my mind, I'm still thinking about it. And when I can't wait to get in to the office the next day and sit at the committee table and tell you, hey, let me, uh, let, let me tell you about this essay that I read yesterday that made such an impression on me and share it with my colleagues. When you do that, you've really accomplished something because in many ways at Archmere, in, in a lot of cases, you've got the credentials, you've got the preparation, you've challenged yourself, you've excelled in that rigorous program, you've done well on the standardized testing. So, you've still got to set yourself apart. The essay gives you that opportunity to do it. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I, 
I hope whoever is watching this video is doing the same thing I'm doing. I'm always taking notes when you're chatting uh, with us because I always get some good information. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a bonus question. Uh, okay. Fourth question. Uh, we always want to allow those that are very um, generous with their time here at Archmere to have an opportunity to talk more about their school. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes and telling us about any new programs or new initiatives at Boston College that our families uh, maybe hot off the presses, maybe they're getting some information that nobody else knows or, or just came out. Thanks, Chris, and I'll do exactly that, and I'll limit myself to just that. Uh, there is great news. I, we're, t we're, we're filming this, we're taping this, obviously, in June of 2019. I suspect it'll be in your, your, uh, your, your library there for, for a while. But in the fall of 2021, Boston College will open probably its largest academic initiative in, in, in decades, and that will be the Schiller Institute for integrated science and society that's a mouthful i realize it's the schiller institute for integrated science and society um, as i speak to you here this morning on our main campus we are uh, demolishing an existing building cushing hall and by the fall we will be constructing a brand new building that will house the schiller institute and we're excited about it because the real intent of it the mission of it is to leverage Boston College's existing strengths in not just the natural sciences, but also the social sciences and in the humanities. And to be focused on really addressing our students in the Schiller Institute toward confronting real world problems in three specific areas. Those areas are energy, the environment, and human health. And of course, those are huge areas of concern, I think, for all citizens of the world today. Those are challenging issues for all of us moving forward. The concept that the Schiller Institute is operating, operating under is something called human-centered design thinking. And so we're not just looking at those problems through a scientific lens, as I mentioned to you. We're looking at these problems through the lens of humanities scholars, social science scholars, in addition to science scholars. So by converging those talents and really addressing these problems through multiple channel channels, Boston College hopes to really uh, examine those problems and address those problems in innovative ways because let's face it, they pose huge challenges for this planet right now, huge challenges for all of us as human beings living on, the, on this planet right now. So we are in the process of, of, of sort of uh, marketing this a bit more. There'll be material soon. We're hiring uh, 40 new faculty members uh, uh, to do this. And probably the most interesting piece of the Schiller Institute is that it will also enable Boston College to introduce not a school of engineering, we're not, we're not gonna be that big, but we, it will enable us when it opens in the fall of 2021, we will have our first ever engineering major. We will enroll 40 to 50 students as engineering majors within the Schiller Institute. They'll probably apply through our Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, but that is unquestionably the most exciting initiative right now at Boston College and something that we think holds great potential uh, for students across the country to, to become en engaged with the work of the Schiller Institute and possibly, because we know a lot of students are interested in engineering, uh, look at engineering. We, we, the engineering major that we have, we expect to be a very innovative approach to engineering um, uh, as we move forward. So I hope that uh, as your students are viewing this wonderful conversation that we've had, today and maybe in the years ahead uh, that they'll maybe continue to track uh, the progress of BC opening the Schiller Institute on campus. Yeah, excited to learn more about it. Thank you very much, John. Uh, John, I'd like to thank you as always for your thoughtful, per thoughtful perspective, uh, your willingness to talk with us and, uh, and our families. I, I was really excited when you, when you agreed to jump on board uh, in our inaugural or our beta testing of our, of our three question series. Um, but but thank you very much. We look forward to you coming back here for year 36 uh, yeah. in the fall. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure we're going to have a lot of wonderful students here to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris.